What is combustion? Who was the first to provide a correct explanation as to the nature of combustion? The problem of combustion challenged many of the scientists of the 17th and 18th centuries. The solution required the discovery of oxygen and an understanding of the role of oxygen in combustion. Combustion was completely misunderstood by the alchemists and early chemists. It was known that air was needed to sustain combustion and to sustain life. It was also known that when a metal was heated in air, it changed and gained weight. One of the most famous attempts to explain combustion is due to two Germans, an alchemist by the name of Johann Joachim Becher and a chemist by the name of Georg Ernst Stahl. They are credited with establishing the phlogiston theory for combustion. Phlogiston theory stated that all combustible materials were made of two parts. One part, called phlogiston, was given off when a substance containing it was burnt. The remaining part, the dephlogisticated part, was thought to be the substance's true form or calx. If something gave off a lot of heat, it was thought to be rich in phlogiston. Despite the fact that it was known that combustion could only take place in air, air had no role in phlogiston theory. Similarly, the increase in weight of a metal after combustion implies that phlogiston has negative mass. These should have been devastating to the survival of phlogiston theory, but remarkably it was the prevailing theory through much of the 18th century. The discovery of oxygen was ultimately critical. It has been recognised that many scientists of the 17th century, such as the English scientist Robert Hooke, the Dutch scientist Ole Borch, the Russian scientist Mikhail Lomonosov and the French scientist Pierre Bayen, produced oxygen in a variety of experiments but failed to realise that this gas was a chemical element. The reason for this failure was due to the widespread acceptance of the phlogiston theory. So who discovered oxygen? On this many are credited, but who should be given priority? In 1604, the Polish alchemist Michael Sendivogius described a substance contained in air which he called Cebus vitae, or food of life. In experiments he performed between 1598 and 1604, he recognised that this substance was the same as the gas released when potassium nitrate is heated. The secretive Dutch engineer and scientist Cornelis Jacobson Drebel performed similar experiments and possibly after a lesson from Sendivogius himself purified what he called the spiritus part of it that makes it fit for respiration. In 1621, Drebel demonstrated to King James I, who took a keen interest in science, that his liquor, presumably oxygen, could sustain up to 12 men in a submarine for one to three hours as they rowed some seven miles from Westminster to Greenwich down the River Thames. A third challenger to the title of discovery of oxygen is perhaps the Swedish pharmacist Carl Wilhelm Scheler. He produced oxygen by heating mercury oxide and various nitrates in experiments between 1771 and 1772. Scheler called this gas fire air, echoing the nomenclature of da Vinci and Mayu. He wrote his account of this discovery in a manuscript titled Treatise on Air and Fire, which he sent to his publisher in 1775. This manuscript was finally published in 1777. Perhaps the person most frequently associated with the discovery of oxygen is the English theologian Joseph Priestley. On the 1st of August 1774, Priestley conducted an experiment in which he focused sunlight on mercury oxide in a glass tube which liberated a gas he called dephlogisticated air because it supported combustion and was totally consumed. He noted that the candles burned brighter in this gas and mice were more active and lived longer breathing this gas. Priestley published his findings in 1775 in a paper titled An Account of Further Discoveries in Air. The final challenger most frequently given a right to the claim of discovery of oxygen is the French chemist Antoine Laurent Lavoisier. His claim though is not without controversy. 
In October 1774, Priestley visited Lavoisier's in Paris and related his studies into dephlogisticated air. Furthermore, Scheler recounted that he sent a letter to Lavoisier dated the 1st of September 1774 in which he described his own discovery. Despite these events, Lavoisier claimed later to have discovered oxygen independently. Whether you believe these accusations or not, the reason why Lavoisier is sometimes credited with the discovery of oxygen is because he was the first to understand the importance of this gas and that his studies led to a chemical revolution. Indeed, he was responsible for naming this gas oxygen. He stated that combustion is always and only to do with oxygen, which combines with other substances during combustion. It was also Lavoisier, in a collaboration with Pierre Simon de Laplace, who proved that animal respiration is a slow form of combustion, with the consumption of oxygen and the release of carbon dioxide. In noting that the weight gained by a substance in combustion is lost by the air, he established the law of conservation of mass, upon which all modern chemistry is founded. His theory explained this weight gain that had defined explanation in the phlogiston theory. He is rightly regarded as the father of modern chemistry. He is also responsible for the publication of the first modern chemistry textbook, Traité élémentaire de chimie. It is thus that the study of gases such as carbon dioxide and oxygen and the solving of the problem of combustion is linked inextricably to the emergence of chemistry as a distinct and rational science. So who discovered oxygen? As the discovery has been described as the most important discovery in the history of science, it is not without some cachet. The three most frequently credited are Scheler, Priestley and Lavoisier. The attribution of priority is often decided by national bias. For the Scandinavians it is Scheler, for the British it is Priestley, and for the French it is Lavoisier. Of these three, Scheler was the first to isolate this gas, Priestley was the first to publish, but it was Lavoisier who was the first to understand the discovery. Perhaps Occam's razor, the principle of parsimony, should be brought to bear. If Occam's razor is applied to the question of whether Scheler, Priestley or Lavoisier, or possibly all three, should be credited with the discovery of oxygen, the result is quite clear. None of them. Oxygen was discovered and isolated more than a century before their births. Sindivogius isolated oxygen and correctly associated with that part of the atmosphere required for life. This is sufficient to give priority for the discovery of oxygen to Sindivogius. Thanks for listening.